CollegeNet products and services are wide ranging. Our products include scheduling software, admissions, faculty and course evaluation, international document transfer, management of hospital payables, social mobility, and asynchronous videos to assist in job placement of graduating students. Over the years, CollegeNet products have earned many patents, and most of those are industry firsts. Because of the process of innovation continues throughout the life of any technology product, we know that that innovation depends upon the feedback and ideas that you provide. Therefore, particularly, since you are our leading activist users who have come to be here this week, we believe it's important to include you in our ideas about innovation. Where do we look together for opportunity? What is our objective and why do we care? I am happy to introduce Jim Wolfston, the founder and president of CollegeNet, to offer you a glimpse of some of our latest thinking. Please welcome Jim Wolfston to the podium. Well, thank you very much for that warm applause. It's an honor and a privilege to speak here this morning. And it's a privilege not because there was some kind of speakers committee that was saying, hmm, is it going to be Oprah, or is it going to be Jim Wollstone, or is it going to be Stephen Hawking, hmm. No, of course. Uh, the reason it's a privilege is because it's become very clear to me over the past year that, in fact, we're working together on one of the most important challenges of our time. And I'll, I'll describe what that is, and I think once you see this, like I do, once you understand this, you'll understand a, 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 an extra layer in your own goodness, your own decency as a human being in your career. Uh, so uh, obviously what we're going to do here is, is talk to you about areas of emergence. The title of the conference is Innovation Through Emergence. We want to share with you our ideas, our thinking with respect to innovation, the places we look for potential innovations, and also the disciplines of mind that we apply when we navigate through this space. Now, I mentioned Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking says that the most important challenge of our time is actually the growing uh, division between rich and poor in our world. And he's right uh, to a certain extent. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's pretty close to the problem that, that I alluded to earlier. This is definitely an important problem. It's an important problem because what happens when wealth and, and income split between populations is that it, it creates economic disenfranchisement and eventually social unrest and eventually the rise of authoritarianism and nationalism. And we're seeing some of the beginnings of that, unfortunately, in our own country. Look at what's happening. We think about uh, the median income. We know it's 48,000 for a family of four in the United States of America. But what about that bottom half? What about 180 million people in our country? What's the median income there? Well, it turns out it's $30,000 for a family of four. That's equivalent to the minimum wage in Seattle, Washington. Does anybody here know what the cumulative net wealth of that 180 million people is? Does anybody, does anybody know? Zero is zero. So we have a society now, we have a society unfortunately where the United States is the least economically mobile among all developed nations. We have a situation where the education, the formal education of the people leaving our workforce is actually higher than the people entering our workforce. This is a real problem. I agree with Hawking that this is a biggie. But, and, and we're doing a lot of things about this. We're doing a lot of things at CollegeNet about social mobility. We've hatched the social mobility index and counterpoised the U.S. News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report is about self-aggrandizement. How do I... Uh, spend millions to make my campus the prestigious campus. We think this is empty, vacuous, and we think it's a very poor example to the next generation about self-aggrandizement. Instead, we're saying, let's go to Hawking's problem. Let's recognize those institutions that are doing the most to take students from the lower half of our economic spectrum and to graduate them into good-paying jobs. This is addressing a problem of our time. This is, a, this is high civic work. This is the reason we exist in service to society. And so one of the things we'll be doing at the end of my speech is giving awards to five institutions, five noteworthy institutions that are doing innovations with respect to this problem on their campus. How do they enroll more students from disadvantaged backgrounds? How do they take students and graduate them into good paying jobs? They're going to give us some of their insights, and I'm very excited to learn from them. 
And it's also true that all of us here are working on that problem in some way. We're working with the Coalition of Access and Af for Access and Affordability, elite institutions that know we need to provide more access to disadvantaged, underserved students. Well, we have to do this. I mean, come on. Some of the smartest people in the world come from disadvantaged background. Consider the great physicist John Bell, who was able to settle the question between Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein about whether God played dice with the universe. John Bell was a poor man from, from Belfast. His father was a, a horse trader, and yet he made this an enormous contribution. Same thing for Frederick Gauss. We, we know about statistics. We all studied it in college. Gauss was a peasant. He, his parents were peasants. So part of the reason we want to reach this underserved population has to do with the fact that they've got the grit. They've got the reason. A lot of these people have a reason to learn. They have a reason. They want to climb that economic ladder. And the most important rung in that ladder is your institution is higher education. And here's why I think it's important that we provide access to education. Education, there's two ways in which we can establish critical thinking. Either by catastrophe, whether that nationalism and authoritarianism ends up in another war. Uh, we don't want that to happen. The other place for it to happen is at your institution. It's at your institution, it's at your great institution, because what you're doing is you're bringing people together from diverse backgrounds. And I show up at the university, and I'm all cocky, and I'm sure I'm a smart guy, right? And I've got my ways of thinking about politics and science and religion and so on. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, I'm going to see such a diversity of people. I'm going to see people from different cultures, speaking different languages, with different ideas. And those collisions, those mini collisions, start to shake the surety, the the, uh, the, the uh, uh, assurance of my, my truths. That's, that's where critical thinking begins. It begins at your institution because you can provide those mini collisions that create a little bit of embarrassment, a little bit of shame, a little bit of consternation about how I was so sure that I was right. And if I can start to feel that, I can go to an advanced level of critical thinking that's important with respect to innovation. And that's the power to examine my own context because each one of us is a kind of template. We're a kind of microcosm for all the ideas that we've absorbed. The ideas about religion, the ideas about society, the ideas about culture, the ideas about mathematics and so on, we've absorbed them from our own context. Well, if we can become advanced critical thinkers, we begin to realize that it's not just an idea that creates innovation, it's not an idea that's important, it's also an idea inside a context. It's inside a context. Now, everybody would agree with me, wouldn't you, that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2? Anybody, any uh, detractors from that concept? Uh, well, guess what? Inside your smartphone, it isn't. In that context, 1 plus 1 is equal to 10, because that's all binary, right? So even these fundamental, simple truths can have a different context. And this is important, because it's important to think about ideas. It's important to think about statements in relation to their context. And the important part of the triad, does it deliver benefit? Does it deliver sweetness to the world? That's what's important. That's what your university can gestate. That's what your university pulls forward, just simply by the diversity of experiences and ideas that exist at the real university. These ideas aren't necessarily understood by your top administrators or even by your faculty, because quite often people come out of the university with a lot of hubris themselves. They've been reinforced for their position, their context, and critical thinking amounts to simply saying that other people are wrong. That's not enough. We see that now in our political sphere. But that's not enough. We need people who are able to look at themselves and understand that the ultimate criterion is benefit. What's the benefit that I can deliver in the world? And this is also a formula for brain, brain plasticity. You want to have an anti-aging pill? The best one is to actually play at the edges of your ideas, your capabilities, to keep testing yourself the way these young people do at your institutions. Playing at that edge is where you form new neuronal networks and you essentially fend off Alzheimer's and other diseases because you, you, you train your brain to be flexible by forcing yourself to examine your own context, reviewing your own ideas, whether it's in your family, with your spouse, with your, with your children, uh, with your work, Examine the way in which your ideas do or do not provide benefit. Change them up if you need to. This is the heart of advanced critical thinking. Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of factors impeding critical thinking in our culture. Obviously, the tuition wall. U.S. News and World Report, thank you very much. You've helped erect this enormous tuition wall that basically says no thanks to the kids who are from the lower economic spectrum. That's a travesty. We need to fix that. 
We also have that 50% of our population now believes in conspiracy theories. Strangely, they're talking about um, freedom and so on, but yet they have this underlying uh, uh, acute determinism that tells us that there were some rich Jewish bankers in the 1950s who conspired to subjugate the rest of us. Uh, it's basically anti-Semitic. Uh, it's, uh, it's a travesty, but 50% of our people believe in this garbage. Facebook and advertising, they seem great. Social media, wonderful. Ah, this is good. Well, what happens? It turns people into self-promoters. It turns people into creepers looking around for what other people want. What, what, what are my old friends up to? <laughs> What's my old girlfriend up to? This type of thing. And what's happening there, that seems innocent enough. Hey, why not? A little avocation, a little bit of fun. But what goes on there is Facebook calls all this information about your preferences. And by calling the information about your preferences and giving that to the advertisers, the advertisers feed you back what they think you like and want. Thus ossifying the neuronal connections that you have. It's the antithesis of challenging your context, challenging your ideas. But this, again, is becoming an important force for ossification in our world. We also are finding more and more, because the tuition wall is so high, when you get a student, they're a customer now, you see? They're a customer, and so it's almost turned into the point where you have to mollycoddle them instead of challenge them. This is a dangerous force because that's what the university does in its best, is to challenge people's ideas so they can break into that stratosphere of critical thought, the ability to examine their own context the rest of their lives. It's not lifelong learning, it's lifelong critical thinking. Because when you think critically, you can innovate and you can change. And as the context of the world continues to change, the people who are going to make the most difference are the ones that, who can innovate. And of course, in the political sphere, as I mentioned, we know what's happening when, when rich old white men just decide they know everything and they're right. And their detractors say, uh, similarly, cocksure, no, you're not. We know the truth. No, no, no humility there. So. We're working together. We're working together to preserve the viability of the real university. That's our game. This is the most important thing we can do, in my opinion. It's the most important thing we can do is to make sure that it's viable for people to congregate from different cultures, different backgrounds, different idea sets, so that these collisions occur. And we can hatch the critical thinkers who can solve the problems of social and economic mobility, uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, and so on. It's going to take people who rethink our social and political lives, our pol political ideas. Keeping the university viable is a great mission. That's what we're all doing. It doesn't matter whether you're involved in admissions and you're involved in scheduling. If you're creating a form for a college net, if you're doing accounting for college net, you're part of this great mission. And you can take some pride in the goodness of that activity. So three areas of emergence. Homogeneous is when you take the same thing, take a brick, right, and you duplicate it and move it into a wall, okay? You're taking the same thing over and over again, putting it together into a wall. And we see evidences of that or uh, examples of that in nature. We see a geese, a geese, a geese, a geese. Well, the geese form through a kind of implicit innovation. They come together to form a wedge, and that reduces the draft when they fly. We see in the world of art an example of homogeneous emergence. This is from an artist in South Korea. Take Marilyn Monroe. Duplicate her a whole bunch of times. And watch what happens here. It's kind of cool. <laughs> right? I love it. <laughs> so homogeneous emergence. Marilyn, 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 Marilyn. Assembles into John F. Kennedy. Wow, far out. OK, another thing, and from the world of mathematics, we're doing the same thing over and over again. We think that, oh, excuse me, we think multiplication is 5 times 10. That's the way we learned it. But what's happening deepest in that smartphone I talked about earlier is that multiplication is expressed as repeated addition. So you take 10, you add it to 10, you get 20, you add that to 10, you get 30, you add that to 40, and eventually you're finished. So you're doing the same thing over and over again to get to your result. And a more elaboration here is what's called the Mandelbrot set. Mandelbrot set's pretty cool. You take this one function, x squared plus c, and you express it in the complex plane in this circle of radius 2. And you ask the question when you iterate on that function, you put a seed value from inside that sphere, or excuse me, inside that circle. You put it into the formula, you iterate. And if every iteration to infinity leaves you within that circle, that point is in the Mandelbrot set, and you color it black. And the points that are outside the set, but still within the sphere, are colored by the modulus of the color. 
that exited this, this circle. Okay, that sounds like a lot. I can spend some time with you later and describe it, but it's just cool. It's an example of how you do the same thing over and over again, and you get this extraordinary result. Check this out. This is the Mandelbrot set, right? Now, doesn't this look like something that's going on in, in nature? Isn't that just far out? That's infinity, just within this circle of two, radius two, okay? You can go on ad infinitum because in that circle of two exists an infinity of points, yet it doesn't include all points, so infinity does not equal everything. Anyway, I think it's kind of interesting as an example of how, gee, even Einstein got something wrong, he's human. He said, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. Excuse me, we just prove, disproved that. We do all kinds of things over and over again to get a different result. And that's okay, we chop the tree, chop, 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 same thing, chop, chop, chop. Eventually timber, the thing falls, right? A different result. Homogeneous emergence. The next is heterogeneous emergence. It's where we look for the potential of combining things that are different. You take those bricks and you combine them into something else. Here's an example. You take these pieces that you've assembled and now you can construct a building. You take the walls that you assembled through homogeneous emergence, and now you take these disparate pieces and connect them into a building. Another example is the logo for this conference. What we did was we took a picture of a sky, we took a picture of a plate, and we took a brass gear, and we put them together. And it was kind of cool because it's also a double entendre because you have an emerging sun here, you see. Another example is organic emergence. Organic emergence is very important. It's what we strive to do at CollegeNet with respect to basic processes. If we look at photosynthesis, for example, photosynthesis, same process, same biological process, nature is our guide. We press the button and we see that we can grow a rose out of photosynthesis or we can grow a sequoia, or we can grow any number of other types of flora. All of us depend in some way upon photosynthesis. This is exactly what we're doing at CollegeNet. We look for CollegeNet services. We have a really brilliant team headed by a great guy named Sean Brownfield. He's looking for these processes, like, for example, email management, file services, and ultimately video. Video, we have a lot of patents in video. You're going to see some fantastic stuff out of Jeff Bolton and his group. We're looking to create services that we can imbue and infuse into other products that we are creating. So that brings me to disciplines of mind. Disciplines of mind. What, how do we navigate all this space? How, do we, how, do we, how, how are we responsible for so many firsts and so many patents? What are we thinking about when we're going through all these different areas of emergence? Well, disciplines of mind are really, really important because the aisle of ideas down the grocery store of ideas is loaded with sugar candy. It really is. And the health of innovation determines a lot by how disciplined we can be when we make our choices. So. The first of these is humility about the future. We hear so much woo-woo about how we can predict the future, whether it's by intuition, tarot cards, and so on. There's all kinds of ways we can predict the future. I thought it was really uh, impressive. To, uh, I was lucky, Jeff Bolton and I went to a conference down in San Francisco, and it was, uh, one of the speakers was Stephen Wozniak, and Jeff and I were part of a group that was able to break out with the Woz later. And Woz, as you know, is one of the co-founders of Apple Computer. He's now a billionaire, and he's a very successful guy. And they started to ask him in our little group, well, well Waz, what do you think about the future of AI? Well, what, what do you think is going to happen? And uh, Waz said, I don't know. He said, uh, then what, what about robotics? What do you think is going to happen? He said, dude, I, I don't know. He says, I'm wrong 80% of the time. I can't predict what's going on. And he went on to say, he said, look, I respect Stephen Jobs. He's my friend. He said, but look, all this press I read about how he turned me on to Dylan, that wasn't true. He says, and then, and then they're saying all this visionary stuff, come on, the, the Apple III was a failure, the Macintosh first one was a failure, the, the Lisa computer was a failure, the Newton was a failure. This visionary stuff is bogus. He said, and I really thought that was great. It was great to hear another technologist finally say, come on, give me a break, we cannot see the future. I assure you, I am not a visionary, no freaking way. And the important thing about that, that humility about the future, is that it lets us really focus on the present. It's almost Buddhism. You gotta focus on the present. You gotta see what's going on, particularly in the changing context of technology. It changes so fast. And our world is changing faster and faster. So if we can develop that skill, that discipline, to pay attention to what's going on. I have this theory about what's great for my kids, right? Great, great theory. Well, BS, if it's not making them happy, if it's not working, change it up. 
Okay, so humility about the future is one of the greatest disciplines paradoxically for innovation. In other words, paying attention to the present is the biggest clue to affect the future. And I can give you proof when people tell you that, oh, the universe is consciousness. All right, we hear a lot of that woo-woo, right? <laughs> Excuse me, the universe is not consciousness because if consciousness equals the ability to be aware, whether it's subconsciously or otherwise, there's just stuff we can't be aware of. I'm sorry, folks, we depend upon the sun, but we do not know what is going on at the sun right now. We're not going to know for nine minutes. And it's true about those, those stars that are out there, the galaxies that are out there. When they say a thousand light years, they mean it. And we're looking at old stuff. We're looking, out, we're looking inside. We are restricted to inside what's called our time cone. All right, now, so when time passes, the sun finally makes it, and now it's inside the time cone, and we can see what's actually going on in the sun. And you can extend that out to the galaxy. But all that other stuff outside of our time cone, sorry, we cannot be aware of it. There's just no way. And the same thing happens with respect to the very, very tiny level. We understand our humility at the very tiny level. When you do this double slit experiment, this has been around for, for 100 years, by the way. This is really far out. If you've, have you ever heard of, of, of particle wave duality? Well, get this. Shoot one electron at a double slit. It's going to go through one or the other of the slits, but it's going to go through them as if it's a wave. It's going to end up on the uh, detecting screen in one of the points that I just showed you here. But if you dare, if you dare try to peek at nature, nature says, sorry, you can't watch. It turns it into like a baseball. So it goes through one or the other slits and just piles up directly across the other side of the screen. It's really strange. It's really far out. But the, what is the lesson that we take from it? Do we get all hubris and say that, oh, this proves that consciousness is the universe? No. We just don't know. Nature has thrown a curtain in front of us. Now, I love this quote. This is from a, a beat poet in Los Angeles, Charles Bukowski. He says, the problem with the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts, while the stupid ones are full of confidence. <laughs> I think that's, that's wise. <laughs> Benefits is experimental and empirical. Remember I said that. Remember I said that there's a triad in terms of advanced critical thinking, advanced innovation? One of those pieces is ideas, obviously. Oh, I have a great idea. Another is the context in which that idea plays. But the third is benefit. This is the most important, the benefit. It's like Francis Bacon, the great Francis Bacon said, the father of, of scientific revolution, who said, if it, is, if it doesn't bring benefit to life, set it to naught. <laughs> Thank you. That was pure. That was a wonderful idea. And you can tell in science, people say, oh, scientists, scientists are hubris, scientists are arrogant, and so on. Excuse me, the hypothesis is itself a statement of humility. It's saying, I don't know what the outcome's going to be. And science, in its best practice, preserves that, that objectivity. It says, all right, here's my statement. If I, if I do X, will Y occur or something else? And then set it up so it can be observed. State it clearly so others can test it. This is the essence of empiricism. This is the essence of experimentalism. And it's very, very important as a discipline of mind with respect to innovation. Uplifting slogans. There's another one. We hear all these uplifting slogans. Wow, so many slogans. To sell stuff, frankly. But they don't equal beneficial action necessarily. Look at all these slogans we've heard for 100 years. Come on. Get me a Coke. Coca-Cola revives and sustains. <laughs> it adds life. I can't beat the feeling, open happiness, come on. Where's my Coke? <laughs> but what's really occurring is over the past uh, 100 years, we see an epidemic of diabetes. Does that bring happiness? Does that add life? Does that sustain? Excuse me, no, it doesn't. In fact, by 2030, it's expected that half of our population will suffer from diabetes. But yet, the slogan, sell it. We see the same thing with respect to conspiracy theories. We see this conspiracy theory that it was all contrived by, by Jewish bankers. The, uh, the, the money behind this is one of the heirs to the Procter and Gamble fortune. He's a guy, he's a right winger who doesn't want any taxes, which is absolutely the most regressive thing you could do with respect to, to social and economic inequality. Uh, but he lavishly produces this, this movie with scenery of, of children in daisies and babbling brooks and so on to promote a conspiracy theory. And after this movie was released, it got 12 million to 13 million hits on YouTube. But then the people who were interviewed disavowed it. 
They disavowed it and they left, but still people promote this movie. Cults, for example, in Arizona and in Ukraine are promoting this, this uh, asinine movie. Hard work versus free, free lunch. Okay, here's another one you hear. You hear that, oh, there's an easy way, there's a route, there's a, there's a trick. Uh, here's a guy that's selling infinite possibilities for 2,000 bucks. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's immersion into intuition. Now, intuition, trust me, is a wonderful tool. We all know that. But it's not foolproof because, again, we don't know how to predict the future. There's a lot of intuition I've applied in the stock market that's been pretty doggone stupid. Didn't work. Sorry. So to get what I want, really want, without, without hard work or struggle, give, oh, give me some of that. <laughs> nope. We won't do that because we know the, the, the beauty of this German proverb, you will become clever through your mistakes. And we also see this research that supports this. This is a wonderful book. I highly recommend this. How do you, how do you get all these fantastic soccer players from Brazil? What's going on there? What gestates these people? How about the, these, these little, uh, this little island, Curaçao, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, from the Caribbean, produces these, these teams that compete in the, in the Little League World Series. What are they doing? And what about these great uh, female tennis players coming from Russia? What, what does that happen? What he explains is that these people are playing at the edges of their ability. They're making mistakes. They're playing at that edge. They're not too far beyond that to get discouraged, but they're playing at the edges of their mistakes. This is where neuronal networks get formed. This is how they get formed in your brain. This is the anti-aging pill, to push yourself a little harder in the gym to do something you're not used to doing. To, to, to go to a country you haven't been before in a, in a foreign language that you haven't experienced. Keep doing those kinds of things and you'll stay young. Finally, what he says here in the book, and it's really beautiful, he says, struggle isn't an option. If the game for forming new neuronal connections is physical, struggle's not an option. It's where you get to in order to innovate, in order to create those new neuronal networks, those new connections. And finally, he says, if you don't love it, you'll never work hard enough to be great. And I can tell you, I can speak for everyone at CollegeNet, that we love it. We understand the importance of keeping the viability at your university. And we're going to keep the innovations going together. Thank you very much.